On Tech News Today, we've got new details on how the Apple Watch will be sold and why is Yahoo pulling out of China. In today's episode, we've got brilliant journalists from Recode, 9to5Mac, Reuters, and The Wall Street Journal. Stick around. Tech News Today is next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. <laughs> This is Tech News Today for Thursday, March 19th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. And by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journals who report it. My name is Mike Elgin. Welcome to the show. Our co-anchor today is Rico Deputy Reviews Editor and Senior Reviewer, Katie Borat. Welcome to you, Katie. Thank you, Mike. Nice to be here. So glad you're here now. You've got reviews editor all over your title. You've got, I think it's mentioned twice in your title. And you do a lot more than reviews, though, and you do a lot more than writing reviews. You also do a bunch of videos. Can you tell us a little about the uh, uh, the range of your activities at Recode? Uh, well, I do a video every week with my reviews, so that helps kind of illustrate some feature of the product and lets people see me using it or lets people see it in a kind of unique way. Uh, and uh, the rest of the reviews team does the same. So we each spend a certain amount of time with these videos every week. And we also attend events to make sure that you have the latest news about the event, live tweeted or live blogged or whatever the case might be. And we meet with the right people afterwards and hear the right things and um, report it back to you. So it's constantly changing. It's, you know, always exciting in the tech world is, is nonstop. So we love it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's great stuff. And if uh, every anyone out there is using an iPhone, you should check out a piece that Katie wrote yesterday about a lot of underused features on the iPhone. It's uh, kind of eye-opening. There's some, a lot of cool stuff that hardly anybody uses. Uh, and so you should definitely check that out, recode.net. Well, let's jump into the news. As we get closer to the hotly anticipated launch next month of the Apple Watch, details around how Apple will sell it are starting to emerge. Now, Mark Gurman at 9to5Mac is reporting new information about what the Apple Watch process will be like. And Mark joins us now. Welcome to you, Mark Gurman. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Now, unlike any previous Apple product, the Apple Watch has to be tried on. What are your sources telling you about how Apple plans to manage the large numbers of people who are going to want to try on different models of the Apple Watch? Right, exactly. So, Differing from like a Mac, iPhone, or iPad, Apple really wants people to try on the Apple Watch before they purchase and really decide the best casing plus band combination. Um, so basically stores are going to have, as they announced the keynote, a table where a bunch of the watches are going to sit under a glass surface. And each table is going to have at least 10 try-on stations, and that could range up to 20, depending on the size of the store. And basically, there's going to be four different sections around the store. There's going to be a try-on section, a sales section split up into people who know what watch they want and people who are still trying to decide, um, and a section or a zone for people to just ask questions about the watch and learn more about it, and a fourth section just for buying the pricier 18 karat. Apple Watch Edition models, and those are going to be managed by what are called experts, people who have extra customer service training, people who have flown to Atlanta, Cupertino, Los Angeles, New York, uh, Sydney, UK, a few other places in February for special Apple Watch training. So only the most trained sales representatives will be able to sell the, uh, the gold models, which start at 10K. So, Mark, not all of the stores are going to carry these special $17,000 watches. Is that right? That's correct. So it's only going to be in certain markets and in certain department stores that Apple's partnering with. So maybe the store at your local mall won't have the edition models. 
Uh, but we're told most stores have safes in the back now, so it's possible that they'll still have the gold models on display or they'll be able to order the, the gold models and store them in the safe until they're picked up. So they're not going to stock them inventory-wise, all the stores, but it seems likely that at some point you'll be able to order one to any Apple store for pickup. Now, the Apple Watch ships April 24th. Will uh, Apple Watch fans have to wait until that date in order to try one on? No. So as Apple announced beginning April 10th, you'll be able to go to any Apple retail store and try on the Apple Watch using that four zone setup that I discussed earlier. Um, and Apple is expecting some lines and lots of people coming into stores. And an interesting thing we learned is that 75% to 90% of Apple retail store staff are going to be allocated just to Apple Watch try-ons and answering Apple Watch questions. Wow. Uh beginning April 10th. So if you're trying to buy um, an iPhone, they'll probably help you with that too, since they're really pushing Apple Watches and iPhones to be sold together. But if you're looking for something like a Mac or an iPod or whatnot, you might want to go in before the 10th. But of course, like the other 25 to 10%, they're probably really going to be stationed around the new MacBook, which is also coming out on April 10th. And Mark, do I need to make a reservation for this? I know just going in and getting a Genius Bar appointment can be a real pain in the butt, but this sounds like a nightmare for people who want to just walk in the door without any kind of planning. Do I need to right. tell them ahead of time? So reservations are going to be recommended, but not required. And they're currently working on a text message, SMS-based solution to be able to come in tell them that you're interested in trying on the watch, and then you can go roam around the mall and they'll send you a text message when it's ready for you to come back and try it on. So they don't want people really waiting around and to crowd up the store. If there's no room for you, they'll text you when to come back. Cool. Mark Gurman is at 9to5mac.com and you can follow him on Twitter at Mark Gurman. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mark. Thanks as always. I really appreciate it. All right. We've got some more news for you in just a sec, but first, let's talk about Gazelle. Uh, I love talking about Gazelle because I've been using them for a long, long time to sell my used gadgets, to monetize my old stuff so that I have the money to buy new stuff. Uh, that's why I like them. The other reason I like them is because I'm super lazy, and uh, Gazelle is very, very easy to use for selling your device. Just go to the gazelle.com, that's G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com, and... Choose the device that you have that you'd like to sell to Gazelle. And then, you know, there's an option there, some radio buttons for choosing what the condition of that phone or tablet is. And then they give you a price. And I think that if you're like me, you'll be surprised by how much they're willing to pay for your old device. They send you a box, you put the device in the box, and off it goes. And you get paid very, very fast within a few days of your item being received. They'll also wipe your data for free. And of course, nowadays, Gazelle recently offered the new feature of selling uh, pre-owned devices, uh, including certified like new devices, which are indistinguishable from brand new phones and tablets. Uh, and all devices have been put through a rigorous 30-point inspection to make sure that they work perfectly. And of course, a 30-day uh, guarantee will take away all the risks. So if you're not completely satisfied with the device you buy from Gazelle, send it back. They give you a full refund. Find out what your iPhone's worth. Take a minute and go to gazelle.com to find out. Britain yesterday announced it would regulate digital currencies like Bitcoin. Specifically, the government will apply anti-money laundering rules to the exchanges. Jemima Kelly is a reporter for Reuters and joins us now from London. Welcome to you, Jemima. Hi, thanks, Mike. Now, does this make the UK an instant leader in the world of digital currencies? I think it makes the UK heading 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 in that route anyway. I think the UK has 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 said that it wants to become a leader in in fintech in general. Um, the Chancellor George Osborne has said that that he wants to become a global capital for fintech. I think that it's definitely you know it's a step in the right direction. Um, it's it's what the, the industry has kind of welcomed it and has said that it so represents a good kind of middle ground between some countries where there's really no regulation whatsoever and therefore businesses and banks kind of ste steer well clear of it, and other places such as the U.S. where um, the Bitcoin community in Britain anyway feels that some of the regulation may be a bit heavy-handed and may stifle some of the innovation that perhaps would go on otherwise. Jemima, does this legitimize cryptocurrencies in the minds of investors? I think that's what that's what that's what the Bitcoin community is saying. I think I think one person's 
put, put, put it in the way of saying that, you know, it's, it's effectively the government giving a stamp of approval to digital currencies. And most famously, most famous of the digital currencies is obviously Bitcoin. There's been a fair bit of anxiety around Bitcoin. Obviously, it's, be, it's, it's, it's been used for illegal, you know, illicit means, illicit financial transactions. Um, and it's been a target for hackers. So I think, I think ma- many governments have kind of steered well clear of even getting into Bitcoin. But I think the, the fact that the government is now coming in and saying, you know, we want to invest £10 million in, in, in a Bitcoin research initiative. We've got the Bank of England also saying that it's looking into whether central banks could issue digital currencies. I think that's really kind of showing that the UK is taking this seriously and it's definitely stamping a seal of approval on digital currencies, I think. Now, the UK government also released a report from its Office for Science, which suggested that, quote, digital currencies such as Bitcoin have the potential to replace traditional currency. That sounds like a pretty radical statement from a government like the UK government, which is very uh, conservative in terms of financial matters like this. Um, did, Did that surprise some people in the UK? Yeah, it did actually. That was that 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 line was actually um, kind of highlighted to me by 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 someone who is a um, a board member on the UK Digital Currency Association. I think it is quite a radical thing to be saying. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I, I think I think what a lot of people in the Bitcoin community and digital currency community say is that it's the it's the technology behind behind Bitcoin itself that's that's really might revolutionize not just the financial world but all sorts of other areas like law for example you know there's this blockchain technology behind it that um keeps a record of every single transaction um and is unable to be tampered with um so i think perhaps that was that was quite an extreme i mean that was that that report was a separate report looking looking into the technology behind it i think it was i, I don't think it was trying this government is trying to suggest that central banks are going to go away anytime soon but i think it was just showing how far you know how revolutionary how potentially revolutionary this technology could be all right well jemima kelly is at reuters.com and you can follow her on twitter at J- jemima joanna thank you so much for joining us today jemima thanks for having me all right Yahoo is pulling out of China, laying off up to 300 employees and shutting down its Beijing Research Center, according to a report in the Wall Street Journal by Doug McMillan. Doug joins us now to talk about it. Welcome to you, Doug. Hi, thanks for having me, Mike. Thanks for being on. Now, why is Yahoo leaving China? So this is the latest in a series of layoffs and uh, office closures, mostly focused outside the U.S., that Marissa Meyer, the CEO of Yahoo, has been doing over the the past several months. She's laid off about uh, 700 to 900 employees um, from Yahoo over just the last five months, which when you add it up is a pretty sizable chunk of Yahoo's workforce. They have a total workforce of about 12,000. And this is all stemming from the fact that Marissa is under pressure to turn around this company. And part of that is cutting costs. So trimming some of the fat here. And right now it looks like China um, is the office that she's picking to reduce some of this, these cuts. This is um, their, last, their last physical presence remaining in mainland China. Um, they really have no products or services there left anymore anyways. But it was basically, it was, a research, it was an R&D center, and she's laying off about 200 to 300 employees um, who are mostly engineers in China. So this is Katie Barad. Hey, Doug. Uh, Hi, is Katie. The, is the official reason a smokescreen for more of this friction between the Chinese government and Western tech firms in general? So I I don't think so. I was told, you know, by a source that that has nothing to do with it, that, you know, obviously um, Yahoo has a history with, you know, the government censorship in China. Marissa has a personal history there. She was an executive at Google when right. Google had that, you know, big controversial decision to walk away from China in 2010. Um, I don't think that that's what's going on here. Yeah, because Yahoo actually wasn't actually running services in the country anymore. So this is not really, there's nothing that they could have um, censored. Um, This is more, I think, stemming from Marissa's desire just to kind of trim the organization. You know, normally uh, companies in general don't cut 
activity in China, one of the fastest growing and largest economies there is. I think that, uh, you know, not to belabor the point, but I think that to a large extent, uh, the Chinese government has taken all the oxygen out of the out of the room for foreign companies that do the kinds of things that Yahoo does, that do the kinds of things that Google does. In other words, information access, providing in, uh, access to information. They like to control, they like to censor. And right now the Chinese government is sort of regressing in terms of its uh, authoritarianism by cracking down on all kinds of activity online. It's really become a repressive environment. And, um, and I wonder if, um, you know, if this isn't, you know, part of their pessimism. I mean, you, you, you would expect that if, for example, if you can imagine an alternative reality where China was a democracy and it was kind of open and they had a free market economy, you can imagine Yahoo really wanted to get in there and be a player in the, in the vast array of services that Yahoo provides the rest of the world. And so, so just, just before we let go of this whole idea of friction between Yahoo and the Chinese government, can you give us a bit of history, uh, more history, about their, 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 um, their history with the Chinese government? I mean, they, they, back in the day when Marissa was at with Google, there was um, a big scandal where the Chinese government was accused of hacking uh, Gmail accounts, but they also hacked Yahoo email accounts as well at that time, didn't they? Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember all of the exact details, um, so I'm not going to try to recount it in, in great detail. But there was um, uh, a activist um, named Shi Tao um, who um, had, you know, the Yahoo was accused of essentially cooperating with the Chinese government to kind of hack into his information and get some of his information. Yahoo ended up being sued by he, that. Ma that man went to jail. His family ended up suing Yahoo, and Yahoo ended up settling that case in 2007. And it was this big kind of black eye for Yahoo in the region, and actually um, was a big kind of red flag and a warning sign and a cautionary story for other internet companies um, in China. What has happened to Yahoo in China um, in the past, since then, actually heavily involves another company, Alibaba, which, um, you know, Yahoo made that great investment in Alibaba um, right. way back when that company was just founding. And Alibaba has since gone to kind of play, you know, the, role, the kind of role um, in China, in the Internet of China, that Yahoo once played in its heyday in the U.S. Alibaba is very much kind of this mega Internet portal for a lot of content and information and and, uh, you know, mobile services in China. So I think, you know, this is just kind of speculation at this point. But uh, perhaps, you know, Yahoo's gradual withdrawal from this region might have something to do with the fact that, you know, they're very close um, allies with Alibaba, one of the main Internet powers in the region. And, you know, perhaps they're happy kind of seeding that region um, when, you know, rem remember that Marissa has plenty of other obstacles with that. Um, yeah. I, I think that probably there's a lot going on here, um, but China is not kind of the first on Marissa's list in terms of kind of growth and expansion. Yeah, I was going to say, if we take China out of the picture for a minute, this is more layoffs for Yahoo at the end of the day. You know, are, do you have any indication of more layoffs anywhere else coming up? I, I would be surprised if they're done. Um, you know, this is an interesting question. Is, you know, is it better to do one large, massive layoff at a company? Clearly, Marissa has acknowledged through her actions that Yahoo is too big of a company. Uh, you know, this is a large 12,000-person um, uh, organization. And in many ways, as they move into kind of the mobile world, they're competing with smaller, nimbler startups to create like mobile apps. So I think that she's acknowledged through her actions that Yahoo needs to slim down um, and be, kind of become more nimble. Um, but the way she's doing it is not to do one big massive layoff, but to do kind of death by a thousand cuts where she's you know, <laughs> cutting uh, people, um, you know, at, at least on a basis, it looks like. One report, Business Insider, a few weeks ago said that she was laying people every Wednesday. Um, so I, you got to wonder what this does for, mora Thanks. for morale at the company when you're, you're sitting around and you don't know who's next. Well, the way to do Ugh. it is to lay everybody off at once, according to Machiavelli. Uh, and she this should read up on that. Tried and true, yeah. Yeah. Well, Doug McMillan is at WSJ.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at DMAC1. Thank you so much for joining us, Doug. 
Thanks, Doug. Thanks, guys. China's Huawei became the world's top applicant for international patents last year, according to the United Nations World Intellectual Property Organization. U.S. mobile chipmaker Qualcomm was the number two, and Chinese Huawei rival ZTE was number three. Twitter's Vine updated its iOS app to preload Vine videos so you can watch while offline or watch faster when you're online. Uh, quite a cool feature, I think. I think uh, I'd like to see a lot more... Uh, uh, apps do this sort of thing because, of course, if you're going to go and they've already queued up, they know what you're going to watch, they might as well preload it so that, you you know, it'll go faster. Mike, do you use Vine? I do. I I, I was a heavy user for like a month, like <laughs> yes. a year ago, and then I, I've come back to it recently. I, I like it. Yeah. I just forget to use it, actually. I know. That's, I think, my problem, too. It's there. It's really fun when you get engrossed in it and you kind of lose yourself and then you forget about it. I don't know. I need a way to kind of remind myself that it's there. It's yeah. so hard, especially now we have Meerkat. We have all these other ways to capture whatever it is we're doing. It's just there's so much competition in the capture it market, uh, you know, everything from photographs to, you know, Instagram and so on, that it is difficult. You know, it's kind of funny. When I was a heavy user, um, I happened to be uh, living in Spain at the time, and we were in uh, Sevilla, Spain. Spain during a big festival where, um, uh, you know, all the women dress up in traditional, like, Spanish costumes and stuff like that. And I was vining like a maniac. And then I sort of, that's pretty much when I wandered away from it. And I came back to it about a month ago, and I was just, like, almost crying because they were so awesome, these vines, uh, at the, uh, you know, taken in Spain. Uh, so, um, anyway, that was, uh, that was pretty... Uh, uh, interesting to, to realize that. And, and uh, like you say, it's very difficult uh, to remember to use it. I guess that's one of the, the big problems. Yeah. Well, Google updated Google Maps for iOS yesterday by adding full screen mode, color-coded public transportation routes, Zagat reviews filters, and faster voice search. In mergers and acquisitions, the Japanese online retail giant Rakuten is buying the U.S. ebook company Overdrive for about $410 million. Overdrive specializes in ebook rentals to U.S. libraries and schools. The move buys Rakuten both new access to the U.S. market and also instant participation in the sharing economy, which apparently is very important to the company now. In October, Rakuten bought U.S. discount store Ebates.com for about a billion dollars. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't know about Overdrive because it's kind of the company that's been in the background for all these library ebook rentals for years. I, I wrote about it, I don't know, three years ago. Um, but, but yeah, it's a really interesting company. Good for them. Yeah. Well, Opera has acquired SurfEasy, which makes a virtual private networking app and other products. The buy represents Op Opera's uh, first security-related acquisition, interestingly enough. Opera told TechCrunch that SurfEasy's mostly freemium apps will continue to be supported for now, but my guess is they're going to build some of that technology into the Opera browser. Well, in just a sec, we're going to have a lot more news for you, but first, let's talk about Blue Apron. You know, lots of people go on diets. They want to lose weight and get healthy. Uh, you know, that's a terrible idea, generally speaking, in my opinion, because diets... Uh, cause suffering and, and people can only do it for so long and then they go off the diet and then you go back and forth and then you have uh, you're back to where you started and you've done a lot of suffering and you've also haven't lost any weight. The better way to do it in my opinion is to eat real food is to eat healthy quality food that you make yourself. Homemade food is the way to go and Blue Apron is a brilliant and super easy way to make homemade food. They send you a big box with three meals in it three meals for two and these are inexpensive, less than $10 per meal, and they're better than restaurant quality meals. I have a blast making them. At my house, my wife does most of the cooking because she's such a brilliant cook. But with Blue Apron, I can give her a break and make food that even she likes. And so I, I do all of the Blue Apron cooking at our house. And I just find it really fun because it's like takes about a half typically it takes me about a half an hour to make a Blue Apron meal. And it just ends up being this amazing dish that uh, – uh, makes me look like a, a genius. Here's something that I made, um, I guess, about a few weeks ago. Um, and here's a picture of the box I got. So you see how everything is labeled. You get all the ingredients um, and only the ingredients you need. So there's no waste. And these are fresh, local, seasonal ingredients, always the healthiest kind. Here we go. I've, I've laid out a single meal. Uh, this is um, 
Mulligatani. How do you say that, Katie? Mulligatani? You got it, yeah. Okay. Chicken <laughs> mulligatani soup. I don't know how to say it, but apparently I knew how to make it. This was a really, <laughs> really delicious uh, meal. And uh, you can go in and choose uh, a vegetarian. If you're a vegetarian and you want to go meatless, you can choose your favorite protein uh, from the options. And then they will send you a new meal every time. They never send you the same meal twice. Sometimes these are pretty exotic uh, uh, international dishes where they have ingredients you're not going to find at the local supermarket. They'll supply those ingredients. You don't have to go buy a bucket of ghee, for example, and make an Indian dish. They'll give you just the amount you need for the dish. Really brilliant stuff. you got to try this. Um, uh, it's a better way to cook, that is for sure. Now, check out this week's menu, menu and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. Two free meals just by going to blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Today. Well, in our courtroom drama segment, Microsoft is facing a new class action lawsuit by Xbox 360 owners who claim that a design defect causes game discs to be gouged. A lower court had ruled that the group couldn't sue in class action, but the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in Seattle overruled that, saying the judge had misapplied the law. In our big number segment, $2.87 billion. That's how many dollars web hosting company GoDaddy is expected to be priced at for its upcoming IPO. GoDaddy tried to go public in 2006, but then withdrew, saying that market conditions back then were unfavorable. It's a lot of Doritos, Mike. That is a lot. Yes, ex exactly. I'm sure Dana Kirkpatrick is uh, really pumped about all this. She's going she's gonna to make out uh, like a <laughs> bandit. All right, another big number for you, three. Thousand. That's approximately how many employees Japan's Sharp plans to eliminate through voluntary retirements, according to a new report on the Nikkei side. That's within Japan. The company may also cut more than 2,000 jobs outside of Japan. Most of those jobs are in the Americas, according to the report. Well, our TNT fan of the day is Dave Troutman of Edmonton in Alberta, Canada. In this picture Dave posted on Google+, Plus, he's enjoying some fresh hot cross buns in anticipation of Easter and watching tech news today. Uh, in anticipation of knowing everything there is to know about the day's tech news. Check it out. Very nice. <laughs> food and food and TNT. It's a great combination. I know. It, it seems like we talk a lot about food here. <laughs> we sure do. It's, that's, that is absolutely true. Well, how do you watch or listen to TNT? Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. And use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT. And we will find it. Katie Borett. Tell us what you're working on these days and where people can read it. Uh, well, I just published a story yesterday about um, things that you didn't know existed on Mac and on iOS. And I thought that was pretty interesting because all of the Apple fanatics chimed in to tell me what an idiot I was that I pointed these things out. So, you know, it was kind of everyone's chance to show off everything they knew. But for average people... Uh, most people do not know about those features. They're really power user features. For example, saving a draft in an email or um, using gestures on the trackpad that you didn't know existed and that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, it was really funny just watching Twitter yesterday. I got all these really obnoxious comments, but I was ready for them. I've done this kind of column before. Um, but yeah, you, you know, it never gets old. <laughs> obnoxious comments are what Twitter is all about. Exactly. Okay. All right, Katie. Well, thank you so much for joining us as co-anchor today. It was uh, my pleasure to have you on the show, and uh, I hope to have you on again soon. Well, thanks for inviting me, Mike. It was right. fun. You can subscribe to Tech News Today on Feedly, and if you don't use Feedly, just choose your favorite way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. You can also watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv or on the app or browser plugin of your choice, which you can find at twit.tv slash apps. If you haven't filled out our Twit survey, we'd love it if you would go to twit.tv slash survey. Tell us what you think of our different shows, how you listen, how you watch. Uh, it helps us improve what we do here at Twit, and we really appreciate your time and also your viewership and listenership and your passion for the Twit uh, army community if you're ever in the san francisco bay area come on in and watch us live we love to have a live audience and you can follow us on twitter at tech news today tv and you can follow me on twitter at mike elgin m-i-k-e-e-l-g-a-n let us know what you think send us email to tnt at twit.tv or call 260 tnt show and don't miss tech news tonight at 4 p.m pacific every weeknight and that ladies and gentlemen is the tech news today my name is mike elgin thanks for tuning in we'll see you tomorrow